Hello, everyone. Today, Xiangqian and I will give a deep dive on Kubernetes Data Protection Working Group. My name is Xin Yang. I work at VMware in the Cloud Native Storage team. I'm also a co-chair in Kubernetes Six Storage and a co-chair in the Data Protection Working Group, working with Xiangqian. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Xiangqian Yu. I work for Google as a software engineer from the cloud storage department. Uh, I also uh, lead the group with uh, with Xin. Thanks, Xiangqian. Here's today's agenda. First, we will provide key updates. We will talk about who are involved in the state of protection Wing group. What is our motivation? Xiangqian will give a deep dive uh, of the change block tracking proposal. And finally, we'll talk about how to get it involved. We have published a white paper on Kubernetes data protection workflows. Here are the authors who have contributed to the white paper. Uh, we also have annual reports. Those are in our community repo. And here we also provide links to our previous KubeCon talks. There are many companies who are involved and are supporting this data protection initiative. So we have them listed here. So let me talk about motivation for this working group. In Kubernetes, the Devon operations for stable workloads are well supported. There are persistent volumes, persistent volume claims to support the volume operations. There are workload APIs such as stable set deployments for declarative management of your workloads and the components of those workloads. According to the 2022 report by the Data on Kubernetes community, more and more stable workloads are moving to Kubernetes. This includes different types of workloads such as database applications, analytics, AI machine learning, streaming and messaging, and so on. They move to Kubernetes because they need to have a rapid iteration and agile deployment. They want to uh, be able to have built-in scalability, which can be provided by Kubernetes. And they also want to be portable. So all of those can be facilitated by Kubernetes. On the other hand, data operations for stable applications, such as protection, data protection, are still limited in Kubernetes. GitOps workflows has limitations for supporting stable workloads. Uh, for example, secrets and config maps cannot be stored in Git, and data stored in the persistent volumes cannot be stored in Git either. So we need to have a better way to support data protection for the stable applications. Data protection in Kubernetes uh, refers to the process of protecting valuable data and configs of applications running in a Kubernetes cluster. The result of the data protection process is typically called a backup. When unexpected scenario happens, for example, data corruption by malfunctioning software or data loss due to a disaster, such a backup can be used to restore the protected workload to the states preserved in the backup. In Kubernetes, a stateful application contains two primary pieces of data. The first piece of data is Kubernetes metadata. It's a set of uh, Kubernetes resources stored and managed in the etc database and accessible through Kubernetes APIs. And the second piece of data is persistent volume data. Kubernetes has the persistent volume claim API to allow users to provision persistent volume for user workloads. Persistent volume data will be managed and stored 
on the underlying storage system. Data protection aims at providing backup and restore of the above mentioned two pieces of data. Part of the data production working group's charter is to define and implement a list of Kubernetes native constructs to enable backup and restore at different levels. This figure shows the backup workflow with existing and missing building blocks in Kubernetes. The blue color shows the process. The green color represents the existing Kubernetes components. Yellow means work in progress, and orange means missing Kubernetes components. To backup an application in Kubernetes, we need to backup two pieces of data, as mentioned earlier. The first one is the Kubernetes metadata, and the second one is the data stored in the persistent volume. There are two ways to backup the volume data. You could use native data dump, such as MySQL dump, or you could use the controller coordinated approach where a volume snapshot is created. To ensure application consistency, the application should be quiesced before taking the snapshot and unquiesced afterwards. The backup of both Kubernetes metadata and volume data will be exported to a backup repository. A backup repository is a location or repo to store the data and the metadata. This can be an object store or NFS or other type of storage. It could be in the cloud or on-prem location. We have a few components here that are green. They are existing features in Kubernetes. We have seek apps owned workload APIs, such as stateful set. We have volume snapshot that has been GA since 1.20 release. We also have a few alpha features. Cozy container object storage interface introduces a set of Kubernetes APIs to allow object buckets to be provisioned and accessed by the pods. There is also a set of gRPC interfaces so that a storage vendor can write a driver to create object buckets in its object storage backend. Cozy can be used together with a backup repository. Consistency group snapshot is another of a feature introduced in 1.27 release. Sometimes application consistency may not be possible or may be too expensive. An application may require the snapshots from multiple volumes to be taken at the same point in time for crash consistency. This feature introduces Kubernetes APIs to create a consistent snapshot of a group volumes. Another existing feature is volume mode conversion. When creating a PVC from a volume snapshot, a user can change volume mode from file system to raw block. This can introduce potential vulnerability to kernel. On the other hand, volume mode conversion is needed for efficient backup workflow. To solve this problem, we introduced the prevent unauthorized volume mode conversion feature. We added a source volume mode field in the volume snapshot content. Volume mode conversion is only allowed if an annotation called allow volume mode change is added on the volume snapshot content. If the annotation is not there, a request to create a PVC from a volume snapshot with the volume mode change will be rejected. This feature is a beta since 1.27 release. In the upcoming 1.29 release, we are going to enable the feature flag to true by default 
in the external snapshotter and external provisioner. So for any application that relies on this workflow, action is required. You must update your application accordingly. Otherwise, your application will fail. We have the change block tracking in a yellow box here. This is the feature that the data protection working group has been actively working on. Xiang Qian will give a deep dive about it later. Now, let me talk about the restore workflow with existing and missing building blocks in Kubernetes. During application restore, we need to import a backup from the backup repository. Restore Kubernetes metadata and the restore PVC and PV. If the volume was backed up natively, we need to restore from the native data dump. Otherwise, we need to rehydrate PVC from the volume snapshot or volume backup. Here, we have another beta feature called volume populator that is very useful during restore. It allows you to create a PVC from an external data source, not just a volume snapshot or another PVC. This also supports the wait for first consumer volume binding mode. Volume populator makes sure a PV is created and populated with data from the external data source, such as a backup and binds with a PVC. So that's all I have for the restore workflows. Now let me uh, hand it over to Xiang Qian to give a deep dive on CBT. Thanks, Jin. Um, so, okay, let's get started. So what exactly is change block tra tracking? Um, from the community's perspective, it's nothing but a, a set of interfaces which allows backup applications or any other rep, um, related features to retrieve a set of changed block on a storage device between arbitrary two snapshots against the same volume. So there are some key things over here. One is, is a set of interface. Secondly, it operates on snapshots of the same persistent volume, which means that you cannot use this API to operate against different persistent volumes, uh, snapshots for different persistent volumes. So the purpose of that is to utilizing the underlying storage systems capability to efficiently calculate those changed blocks for backup purposes or for replication purposes. Now, if you look down the two, graphs underneath the, uh, sorry, the graph underneath the, uh, in the slides. Uh, in a simple way, let's assume there's a volume with nine, nine blocks uh, labeled with one to nine. So at time one, you take a snapshot and that's exactly what the data will look like on your disk or on your persistent volume. Uh, after some certain time, you take another snapshot, let's say uh, T2. And this moment, those ones marked as red color has been touched by the application, meaning that there will be ch there are changes to those blocks. And the purpose of this interface is to effect efficiently return you the changed blocks indexes two six eight nine. Now you can think about it that way. It's not the purpose for this API or interface to return you the changed data content. The only thing it will return to you is the list of changed block indexes. So with that, why do we even need this? So Shinkuru, next slide, please. Uh, the main purpose of having change block tracking is to do backups or replication efficiently. Uh, in this context, it's more about backup. Uh, why is that? Because this will enable incremental volume backup. First of all, from the spaces perspective, you'll be using less space uh, when you conduct a backup because you only copy the deltas uh, instead of the entire volume compared to the full volume backup, of course, to the destination. Uh, in this case, 
let's assume your change rate is about 10%, that you are talking about in between two snapshots, you only copy 10% of the data. Uh, the second thing is actually, it may greatly reduce the network bandwidth requirements. Why is that? Simple, right? Less data to transport, then less bandwidth requirements. And the consequence, uh, you can lower your RPO. Uh, in my net, in my not necessarily, sorry, it might increase your RTO a little bit because during the re uh, restoration, you need to kind of, you know, replay all the change blocks from in between arbitrary two snapshots. But for RPO's perspective, since there's less data to transmit and it's incremental, it can actually effectively reduce the RPO. <coughs> so <coughs> that's one. The other main purpose is there's so many storage systems in this world, right? So enterprise storage arrays uh, and the cloud provider storage systems, et cetera, et cetera. So backup systems in general do not want to have customized solution for every single one of these uh, storage systems. Rather, than the, they want to deal with one set of generic interface, right? That effectively decouples the backup system or the replication system from the storage system. Uh, of course, there are other considerations backup team or backup applications can use. Uh, back, back, they, uh, they can use full backups, which they will suffer in performance and they will be less efficient in space, etc. Uh, they may choose to couple with the storage system uh, just for the sake of, uh, you know, uh, just for the sake of utilizing more advanced features from the storage system, etc. And they also open source tools like a Rustic. Right, Rustic is storage system agnostic. Uh, it calculates the change blocks by itself. Uh, the main benefit is that for backup systems to utilize Rustic is to, you know, they don't need to worry about how, what is exactly the underlying storage system, but it leaves utilizing the underlying storage system's efficiency, efficient way of calculating change blocks not too possible because Rustic does the calculation by itself. So uh, moving on to design principles, right? So we have a couple of goals and non-goals. Next slide, please. The main goals here is to utilize in CSI for um, the interface for change block tracking. That allows, remember one of the main, goal, main things we want to achieve is actually decoupling the backup system from the storage system. So using C CSI is a standard interface, so um, it has nothing to do, uh, it's in independent to the underlying storage system. Uh, the second goal is we have to meet Kubernetes security standard, it cannot be worse. Uh, and the third thing is to, we have to avoid overloading API server. Why? Because the amount of metadata per, per uh, for persistent volume to present the changed list of blocks is tremendous. So we estimate about five gigabytes of metadata per one terabyte of persistent volume. And we all know that API server is actually uh, one of the non bottlenecks of the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, of course, there are a couple of non-goals. So data accessing interfaces for change block, it's not in the, in the consideration because it's so related to the underlying storage system and to the backup system. Uh, as I said, when the interface returns, it returns only the indexes of the blocks. It does not return the changed uh, data content on those blocks. And there's another no-go, which is to keep track of changed files. This is typically, uh, Rustic does provide that. And some of the storage systems does provide that, basically build a catalog of file changes based off of block changes. Uh, this is not the goal of this community to provide such a functionality in the change block tracking effort. So talking about goals and non-goals, let's go through some of the difficulties we went through uh, during the design. Next slide, please. Um, the first block we hit during the process is whether we have the APIs or interfaces as imperative versus declarative. So as all you know, the Kubernetes resource model is all declarative. So basically uh, you define your YAML, your CRD, and you store those CRDs in the API server. There's a reconciler, keep on reconciling on that. Uh, 
the community took that route in the initial initially and utilizing CRD plus aggregated API server. However, due to massive metadata, uh, there, there will be massive that metadata needs to be uh, served, especially the scenario is especially uh, bad, especially bad for the first change block tracking because uh, list. Because for the first backup you do, uh, you literally just back up the entire volume. And that risks, that imposes huge risk of overloading the API server and thus get rejected. The, the, the current thought is to provide imperative interfaces. So we, instead of providing CRDs uh, and using uh, utilizing API server as a data serving pass, uh, we'll be providing gRPC interfaces that allows uh, softwares like backup systems to interact to get the, the data out. That's one. The second thing is how do we hide heterogeneous storage systems that is available to Kubernetes community, right? So um, the answer seems to be pretty straightforward is to define the interfaces in CSI. And then we, there's a, there's a little caveat over here is that uh, we need to define a community maintained gRPC service in front of the CSI interface. I explain why we do, did this in the, in, the, in the next slide. So uh, from the storage systems perspective, they implement the CSI driver. And uh, from the community's perspective, we provide a gRPC service, which provides uh, generic gRPC interfaces for uh, a backup system to use. And lastly, we need to be able to meet the security standards. Actually, that's the, re the, main, re the main reason why we need to hide the CSI interface and again, state provide a community maintained gRPC service. Because we need to do, do good amount of OS N and Z for a, a, across all the clients that try to utilize this feature. Moving on to next slides, please. Uh, I'll go through some very high level detailed designs. So all the way on the back, uh, on the left side is the backup system or anything that they will be utilizing this feature. And the right hand side will be the uh, the core components. So there will be in total seven steps before the backup system or any client can actually obtain the change list based off of the uh, two different snapshots. So the backup system initially tries to talk to the API server via the token request API to op obtain an auth and token. What is contained in this auth and token is actually the identity of the backup system. It can be your uh, service account, or if you're a cloud, cloud provider, it can be your uh, cloud service accounts or some identity that you plug into the Kubernetes cluster. Um, then the backup system, uh, after it obtains token, it includes the token to call the generic interfaces we provide as a gRPC service. It's called, called get delta or get allocated um, there's some differences between these two calls. I will not dive deep into this, uh, the differences. Uh, this is via the TLS connection to the service directly. And once the metadata service, which is the community maintained the service, the RPC service, which requests the, the call from the client, it utilize, it, it, it retrieves the token, uh, or from the request and to do a token review against the API server. That way, the metadata service knows who is calling, who is calling from, and this token review will basically say, "Oh, this is actually an authorized user in Kubernetes cluster to use my service." And once this passed, the metadata service knows who exactly this request is, uh, this request is sent from, and then it does an OSC via subject review. Why OSC here? Why we need to do this here? This is to validate the service account or whoever is calling the gRPC interface has access to the snapshots it provides. So basically, this is nothing but validating whether this, there exists an RBAC in the system, grants that particular user the permissions to access the uh, snapshot in the information. After that is done, the metadata service will go to talk to API server again and obtain the volume snapshot IDs from the system. That is stored in the volume snapshot API and volume snapshot content API. Um, 
After all this, that's the real work gets started. The snapshot metadata sidecar, which is the community ma maintained sidecar, issues a, G a CSI call. In this case, it's a private CSI call to the underlying storage, underlying storage system CSI container with the snapshot IDs provided by, by the client. And this is through a CSI gRPC call via the Unix socket, domain socket. Once this is done, the, the metadata sidecar will wrap the request together in the format it, it provides in the public interface and return the changed block list to the backup system. And this whole thing uh, you know, identifies uh, an entire workflow for from very high level how um, step by step uh, change block tracking, uh, change blocks can be retrieved from two snapshot IDs. And the green line stands for API server calls from the controller or from the client. And the red line stands for gRPC interactions between the between different systems. So this is just a high level with that. Next slide, please. And in reality, you know, this is what exactly it looked like. Uh, you probably won't be able to read the, the image from this diagram. A huge call out to folks who work dedicated on this, Carl, Prasad, and Elon, et cetera. Uh, this is still stolen from their sites that they presented to the community uh, in our data protection working group meetings. Uh, with that, let's conclude to the stat status of the current project. Uh, the dev team is mainly composed by Ivan, Prasad, and Carl. Uh, they've been spending a lot of effort on this thanks to them. And the, the restart kit right now is alpha in Kubernetes in 1.29. Uh, current status is the uh, cap is under review. Uh, both the cap and actually the US, uh, new CSI is under review right now. And they have also provided a POC as a prototype that uh, I put the link right there. Uh, that's all I have for change block tracking. So if you want to get involved, next slide, please. Please feel free to visit the homepage and get an understanding what we are doing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they are bi-weekly meetings hosted on every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So there are a lot of meeting recordings available on YouTube and there's an agenda doc which will tell you what exactly will be discussed during a particular meeting uh, at that. And uh, we have a Google group mailing list. Uh, get yourself subscribed to that group so that you can receive uh, up-to-date up -to -date updates from the group. And we also have a Slack channel um, listed over there. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to communicate with us uh, with via any of this method and feel free to join our bi-weekly meetings on Wednesday. Uh, thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, bye. Bye.